next presenter is Dr. Sarah Bowman. She's the director of the High Throughput Crystallization Screening Lab at the Hotman Woodward Medical Research Institute. And we'll be talking about her center today and how we can screen and optimize crystals using uh, her center services. All right, and I'm gonna try to stay in time here, okay. Um, okay, so uh, like Bill was saying, I run the High Throughput Crystallization Screening Center at HWI, and I'm mostly gonna be talking about that as opposed to uh, optimization. Um, okay, so high throughput screening. Um, we, we offer high throughput screening because as you've already heard from uh, both Diana and Joey, uh, it can be really hard to actually find conditions that your protein will crystallize in. It's one of the major bottlenecks. So once you actually have your crystals and you've cryoprotected and pulled it out, um, the rest of this can be relatively straightforward, um, but this particular spot is, is, a, is a tough spot. And so, um, so who could take advantage of, of high throughput screening? So maybe you have a very well-equipped lab and you've already tried all the screens in your lab. Uh, maybe you manually pipette all of your trays um, and that can introduce a lot of variability. Maybe you manually inspect all of your images. Uh, maybe you're at an under-resourced institute or uh, you don't have any access to advanced robotics or, or imaging and we can help with all of that. Um, you could also really want to efficiently and rapidly screen through 1,536 non-redundant conditions all at once in one tray. Um, and we can uh, work through and, and distinguish protein crystals from salt crystals before you actually put them up on, on the beam. Uh, so that can be very helpful. Maybe you wanna detect submicron crystals and that can actually be really difficult to do um, using kind of standard uh, right field microscopy. And maybe you wanna auto score your images for crystal growth. And we're gonna spend a lot of time on that because it's one of the uh, things we've recently uh, been, we've recently put, put out. So. Okay, so what, what we really do at the Crystallization Center is we've got a high throughput screening option. Um, so we've got a single 1,536 uh, plate and it's the same physical footprint as one of those 96 well trays that you've seen pictures of. And so you can obviously imagine that that allows you to do uh, a lot more in terms of uh, screening crystallization, different crystallization cocktails, as well as minimizing the sample consumption for the experiment. Um, to do this, so if we were like live in a person, I'd be passing around one of these plates and you would be trying to imagine pipetting into it and having a hard time with that because these are extremely small wells. Um, and so we use a lot of robotics to actually set these things up. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of the specific robotics. Uh, we've got, this is an example of a, um, in the middle here is an example of a 96 uh, syringe uh, uh, drop setter. Um, and we have 384 syringe, 96 syringes, 12 syringes. Uh, and so a lot of different, different options. Uh, we also take advantage of a lot of imaging. So uh, on, the, on the left here is our rock imager with Sonic. And we're gonna talk about uh, Sonic, both uh, Joey and Diana uh, mentioned SHG imaging. Uh, we, we use that imaging kind of as a matter of course. Uh, we also have a rock imager. Uh, so this, the Sonic one is actually in, um, is at room temperature. And we also have a rock imager, a little mini uh, that we call Star-Lord. Here's a little icon up here. Um, and that's at uh, 14 degrees. And so we've, we've got a couple of, couple of different imagers that we make use of. Okay, so when we do the high throughput screening, we actually use microbatch under oil. And the reason for that is it's part of what enables us to use very little crystallization condition and cocktail. So we have a layer of oil in each of these wells. Um, and then we put uh, into that layer uh, at the bottom the crystallization cocktail, and then we add the protein on top of that. We spin it down and then we monitor for about six weeks to see what happens um, over the course of that six weeks. And so um, we always actually put uh, image this before we add the protein solution uh, to, as a negative control so that if you have crystals that have formed before uh, you've added your protein, uh, you know that those are salt crystals from the crystallization conditions. When you've got 1,536 of them, sometimes things, the, we watch over the course of six weeks um, at day one, at week one, at week two, week three, and week four, um, suddenly you have a really beautiful crystal um, that stays there at week six. Um, and so, 
one of the questions is what, what if you can't actually see your crystals? What if your bright field images are ambiguous? And so I want you each to look at these uh, wells and try to assess whether they contain protein crystals. And uh, I'd make you uh, uh, participate in this, but I don't have a poll. So I'm just gonna tell you that all four of these wells actually contain protein crystals. Um, and they may not be the most pretty protein crystals, but in some cases, they're the only ones that formed even in the 1536 screen. Um, so how do, how do we actually see these things? We use the Rock Imager 1000 with Sonic, um, which is second order nonlinear imaging of chiral crystals. And so what that lets us do is look at uh, ultraviolet two photon excited fluorescence. It's very similar to looking at kind of a normal UV. Um, and so aromatic residues like tryptophan will fluoresce um, when they're exposed to um, the, the UV um, the UV signal here. Um, and you can see that in this particular image. And then in second harmonic generation, um, this is actually the thing that will detect chiral crystals. Um, it's about a, a good number of space groups uh, will, will work for this. And so you'll see a lot of different protein crystals. There are some um, very high symmetry groups, uh, very high symmetry crystals that won't generate an SHG signal. And so that can be a limitation of it, but in typically it's pretty good. The combination of bright field and UV TPF and SHG are really critical to be able to see these things. So in this particular example at the bottom, you see this kind of bird-like crystal. Um, this is actually, again, one of the occasions where this is the only condition that generated a crystal and you would not have picked out this crystal um, if you were only looking at the bright field. And so, okay, so, we do uh, high throughput screening. So we do a lot of these images. Uh, we, we take a lot of images over the course of, of time. Um, like I said, we do the bright field a number of times. We only do the UV TPF and SHG uh, once during the imaging, um, but we are the only facility that offers this type of imaging for high throughput screening to external users. And so uh, if you're interested in using this, I'm gonna tell you how to, how to kind of uh, contact us about this uh, at the end. Um, so I just want to give you a couple of examples of UV TPF and SHG. So it makes identification of protein crystals really straightforward. So in this case, we've got bright field UV TPF and SHG. You can see that there's actually two different crystal morphologies uh, in this particular well. Um, in some cases, when uh, crystals are obscured by precipitate, like here, um, you can actually see that there are uh, crystals uh, that are forming. Um, they're just underneath the skin. Um, in, in this particular uh, well. And then you can detect things that might otherwise be considered failures. So in this case, this is the single well out of the 1536 tray that uh, had any crystals that formed. And the only way you would be able to see them is by using the UVTPF and SHG. These have since been optimized uh, into kind of macro crystals uh, that can be used as synchrotron. But, um, but this is a potentially really nice uh, technique to be able to detect very small crystals that would be appropriate for things like microAD or XFELP. So, um, okay, one of the difficulties um, when you're doing any type of high throughput screening is that you end up with a lot of data. And so um, we, uh, we have, um, in each of our experiments, we end up with uh, approximately 14,000 images per experimental plate. And so that's a lot of images to have to visibly uh, look through. And so uh, one of the other things we do um, is we recently um, participated in developing machine recognition of crystallization outcomes. It's a collaboration with Google Brain, uh, crystallization centers from worldwide and pharma companies. We together pooled about uh, half a million images of crystals um, and used it to essentially train an algorithm to detect crystals. And so in this case, here's an example well, and it was able to detect and pull out these tiny little crystals with 0.93 probability of there being a crystal. It currently only uses bright field images and it's um, a little bit limiting because um, it, um, it really only, uh, you have to be a pretty good programmer to be able to use it. So you have to have TensorFlow, you have to uh, be able to kind of get in and, and work with the open source software. So this past summer, uh, I had a student 
uh, Ethan Holloman, who actually made a graphical user interface. And we call it Marco Polo, and we use it for hunting crystals. Um, and so uh, the paper actually came out yesterday. Um, and I'm going to actually give you a live demo of it and how, how we use it. But we can look at uh, right field images over time. We can look at the UV and the SHG images. We've got tons of metadata in terms of each, each different well, and there's just a lot of features we can use. Uh, we've got a plate viewer, so we can, we can actually look at different quadrants of, of, the, different, of the 1536 plate, um, and it outputs to PowerPoint. Um, so it's all open source and available on GitHub. And um, like I said, it's currently configured for the 1536 um, screening tray, but we, we are hoping to expand it. So I'm gonna actually, stop sharing my screen and attempt to go over to Polo. Um, can you guys see it? Yes. Thank yes. you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do just a, a little bit of a live demo. Um, so this is a lysozyme tray um, and it's actually been screening for since the beginning of this month. Um, I actually already uh, downloaded the, the data so we can import um, our our data directly from the FTP. We would connect with uh, each each person who sends a sample has an account at the FT, on our FTP that we can download stuff. Each of these has, like I said, 1,536 images. So to pull this many took about six minutes. And so I already did that. Um, I also already auto scored one of these trays um, and picked out a couple of interesting things. So this first image actually, um, was scored by Marco as precipitate, but um, I'm gonna classify that as crystalline. And so we can do things like zoom in and look at the image. We can uh, show all the dates and see when the image actually, or when the uh, tray, that particular well started uh, crystallizing. Um, and we can also show the different spectra. So in this case, uh, we can see over here, UV, TPF and over here, SHG. Like I said, lysozyme, lysozyme is one of those examples that does typically not have a good uh, UV signal. Um, but we can do all kinds of different, really interesting things. Um, so I'm gonna actually, uh, actually filter out and I've, I've selected a few of my favorites um, just to identify a couple of things. So this is a very nice, pretty uh, lysozyme picture. And this is one of the few lysozyme uh, examples that actually gives an SHG and UV signal. Um, these are just really pretty um, that show up in the UV. They've got these absolutely gorgeous uh, tetragonal um, uh, morphology. Um, again, you might get a little bit of an SHG signal. Uh, this is a case where you've got some salt crystals on the top and you can tell that because you've got some signal on the SHG. Um, but when you go down and look at it, you can see that there are crystals in there. And those are show, those also show up in the. And so, um, so these are just some, some examples of how, how this uh, software can work. Um, again, we have a, a plate viewer as well. Um, and I've uh, set this up already with uh, kind of a coloring scheme that I like, um, which is to kind of color the crystals. You can color the crystals, say orange um, and everything else in gray. And this is Marco classified and it will um, kind of identify uh, your, your wells for you. And you can actually look across, um, across the whole plate. Um, now, we, we don't actually put the whole 1536 on here because it would be way too uh, image intensive. We do it in uh, the, the, the kind of uh, biggest number is a 96 well. Um, but keep in mind that each of these 96 wells is actually part of a 1536 plate that, that is all screening. And so there's just a lot of, a lot of um, nice options. You can also, uh, for instance, um, generate what your outcomes are. You can look at the, the different scores um, that have been generated, um, as well as whether you've gone through and scored it. I only went through and scored a few, as you can see um, here. Um, and so the other thing we can do is actually export all of this as uh, either a CSV or a PowerPoint. Um, when you export it as a PowerPoint, you get to select what you want to export. Um, I'll just go and... Um, show you if I still have it. Um, so 
and actually it's going to be a little so you can export it as a powerpoint and so I've, i'm going to actually come back over here now um, and start resharing so the powerpoint export actually looks just like this you can um, it's a really nice way if you're working with collaborators um, to really um, oh, sorry very easily kind of show that you're generating crystals um, what the conditions are that you have multiple different types of image uh, images and you can watch it over time and so all of these things are completely built into the uh, to the Marco Polo GUI and so uh, we're pretty excited about it um, and so uh, hopefully it'll make uh, screening with the high throughput uh, high throughput experiments a little bit uh, easier and easier to then optimize. Um, okay, so how do you scale up and optimize? So, um, you know, so both Diana and Joey talked a lot about this. In, in, our, in our setup, we use 200 nanoliters of protein and 200 nanoliters of cocktail all underneath the oil. And so what you would do is exactly what they were talking about. You set up new trays, typically in 96 or 24 well trays at that point with the different conditions that have generated crystals. Um, and you modify pH, concentrations, protein, cocktail drop ratio, temperature, all of these different things. Um, so for us, um, some of our users will modify direct, go directly from microbatch into new microbatch experiments. Um, I tend to go directly from microbatch to vapor diffusion and I use sitting drops and that works most of the time. Um, if it doesn't work, I go back to, Microbatch into oil, but I have pretty good luck at, at uh, scaling up from microbatch into vapor diffusion. Um, seeding is another thing that is really, really helpful. And so if you're having trouble getting your crystals to grow, I strongly recommend you try that. Okay, the other, a couple of other quick things to talk about um, that I'm not going to actually cover here, but to think about if you have crystals that are really um, fragile and difficult to handle that you can think about in situ crystallization where you actually are crystallizing directly on a platform that can then uh, either be uh, cryoprotected or uh, you can collect data at room temperature directly on the platform without having to harvest um, the, the samples. Um, I encourage anybody who's doing crystallography and collecting data to synchrotron to do a fluorescent scan to check to see if you have any metals in your sample um, because you'd be surprised at the number of different uh, metalloproteins that are out there. Um, and then micro -ED is a is a thing that we're, we're working on trying to develop um, into something that we can actually make use of the things like SHG to see the really small crystals um, and be able to um, move those to the cryo-EM grid to, to then collect micro -ED data. Okay, in my last couple of minutes, I just want to walk through how you actually send a sample to the crystallization center. So uh, we have a pretty easy um, website, um, which I will go to real quick, hopefully. Okay. Um, so um, on our website, we actually have a ton of information. Um, and there's a lot of different tabs and so on and so forth. The really important thing is the deadlines and dates um, because we, because of the high throughput nature of things, we actually have to pre-prepare all of our plates before we can add protein to them. Um, adding protein only takes about 10 minutes, but uh, we typically take a, a, a week or so to, to kind of prep everything. And then we have a particular reservation deadline that you have to send an email to us about um, if you want to uh, reserve a spot in the queue um, and then specific dates. So we actually set things up. Um, so we do things uh, for both academic, nonprofit and research institutes, as well as for proprietary um, people. So, um, so we, we can work with proprietary samples. We mostly work with um, academic people, but we do have an online submission form, which we are not going to go through. Um, but the first question it asks is, have you e emailed us to reserve a spot? Um, so you check the dates um, for the next runs. We have a mailing list for announcements, so you can send an email to us to be added to that if you're interested. Um, you send us an email to reserve a spot in the queue, and then once your sample's ready to ship, you email us the tracking number so that we can keep an eye out for it and fill out the submission form. Um, and then shipping your sample, you wanna do that overnight with either dry ice, ice or ice packs. And if people have questions about this, we can kind of talk about the best way to do that. After your sample set up and after each of your image sets, you actually receive an email from our daemon. Um, and so this is the one I got this morning at about 152 because one of my lysosime trays um, was, was imaged. Um, and so um, 
we, we just send out automatic notifications when that happens. Um, and so with that, I think I am going to uh, stop. You know, I will let you know, you can uh, check out our website. Um, we do have a Twitter, uh, Twitter account. And in the past four years, we've, we've screened a lot of different samples um, from a lot of different research groups. And so um, we, we've got um, a lot of, I guess, expertise in, in how to do kind of this high throughput screening. And so um, with that, I'm gonna stop and see if anyone has questions.